So hi everybody, my name is Mike Reeves. Uh, you can get me on the Twitter machine at uh, Too Smooth. So why am I here and why am I talking to you? Um, so I've been doing this for about mm, 19 years, 16 years of it's been in primarily security and mostly in network detection. I had a little stint of Unix security in there. I work in FireEye. Um, I'm obviously a huge bro fan. Obviously, if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here. Um, I have a lot of experience in large sensor deployments and uh, high performance sensors, so 10 gig, 40 gig types of sensors. Um, I'm heavy into RC radio controlled stuff. Right now I'm really addicted to FPV racing with mini quads. So that's, uh, I've got that mini quad right there. So it's, uh, it's very fun. Um, so I'm addicted to that. So if you want to talk about that, just hit me up. And then um, I'm also a Security Onion contributor with Onion Salt. So we're gonna start out with a little uh, scary story here. So um, how, many are, uh, dot, how many in this room, by show of hands, are .edu? That mostly spend time on EDU. I love EDU networks, they're awesome. It's like the Wild West, lots of bandwidth, no controls, it's so good. Um, so this is really gonna focus on the enterprise stuff of this, right? So there's, there's unique challenges. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a story. Um, we'll call the company E Corp, um, if you go watch Mr. Robot, right? So um, you'll see lots of movie references and stuff like that, but um, it's based off of true stories. Um, so the pyramid of pain, David's not here, he had to leave, but I was gonna give him a dollar since I brought this slide up, so give him, give him his credit. Um, but the, the pyramid of pain is important to think of while I give this presentation so that you know, and the story too, so that you can sort of think, think why um, doing network detection this way is important. So um, you know, this is just easy to, to hard, uh, TTPs and tools right, being the hardest to change. So we won't go into that too much. So, um, at this E Corp company, uh, when we first started doing detection, we had probably a handful of sensors, and we were going after the C2, right? So we had um, outbound access web shells with C2. You know, those guys were sitting there um, doing whatever they wanted to do uh, from their desks. Uh, connect, you know, they didn't have to get into our infrastructure because they were already there. It all spoke out to it. So what we did is we we went after um, sort of our internet presence. Um, now. When you do that at a large enterprise, you could have, I don't know, say 112 internet connections, right? So it's not as easy as saying, oh, we're gonna do this because, you know, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but the adversary knows your network better than you do, right? So, so we went after Alpinas and we locked down, we knocked out all the C2, right? Because they didn't have to be crafty, so they, uh, they, they didn't really disguise themselves. So we, we knocked that out. Well, when we talk about TTPs, we, we change their TTPs, right, at the top of the pyramid. They've got to do something new. So they're adjusting to our TTPs, which we found you here. We're gonna, get, we're gonna put detection in. So they said, okay, well, I'm gonna use a VPN connection, right? So I'm gonna go after your VPN users, and I'm gonna create a shim so that when they're logged into the network, the C2 goes out their internet connection, right? Now I can't see that. You know, I can't do that anymore. Um, so what we did is we covered VPN, uh, which was a lot easier. Um, but then we had this guy, lateral movement. So when you have an organization with, say, I don't know, 500,000 users, there's a little bit of bandwidth in there, lots of sites. Um, so what they do is they say, you know, I know that I can um, go into this business and I can get access here or there and I, I can move around to get data, right? So I know this business over here doesn't take security as, as serious as this one that I want to get all the data from. So I'll own them and then I'll just, you know, pull all the data out there and then exfil it, right? And uh, so we, we locked that down, right? We got sensors on that. We, this is when we got into the really high speed. And this was, oh, like 2006, 2007, I think. Um, so 10 gig was kind of new, right, to do 10 gig. Um, we were doing full NSM, right, full PCAP, uh, snort, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So we locked down the third party, and it got to the point where the adversary would get press releases, right? So they would get a press release and say, we're gonna buy company XYZ. So they would own company XYZ because they don't have our security controls, right? Because they know at some point, security, or, uh, company XYZ is gonna get connected to our network. So doing so, um, they would own it and they would wait. This is the person, they would wait 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, 
waiting for that connection. And as soon as that connection came up, they got a beacon that said, hey, it's here, and they got to work, right? Um, and then when we got that knocked out, they went to DMZ, right? And this is, this is the harder stuff for them from a TTP perspective. They've got to have zero days or whatever, uh, or find Cold Fusion web servers. Uh, <laughs> If you don't know where your ColdFusion web servers are, if you've got the right monitoring place, you will find out because that's where they're using. So, um, so one of the things is they know you're better. They know your network better than you, right? And the challenge is everybody says, oh, "I'm going to create this uh, this vault, or I'm going to create this special area where I'm going to put all my data." Well, that works great for some things, but it, people do work, right? So they have to use their laptops or their computers to do stuff, right? An engineer is like doing engineering stuff on his engineering workstation because you can't use a, a, you know, a virtual machine for that. Um, they know the typical value proposition for network sensors. They know I've got X amount of dollars and We'll get into the whiz bang here in a little bit, but and then I want to put this whiz bang device that costs a lot of money in here to do my detection because I can get the most bang for my buck, supposedly, right? So I can put this big box in there. Well, you know, all these things come through there. Well, they know that. So what are they going to do? They're going to avoid that, right? They know where your detection is. Like if you saw um, in that story I was telling, they they adapted, right? So they knew exactly where our detection was. So they're going to go after you where you're the weakest, right? And that's where network detection is awesome. Right? So uh, packets don't lie for the most part. And you can get things like malware and stuff like that pre-detonation, right? So you can find certain artifacts. If you have process logging turned on on your PCs, you can get certain things. And that's great. Um, but it's a lot easier to create detection when you have that first stage, right, um, instead of the second stage. And you know, people talk about, well, you got to have stuff on the host. Well, that's not realistic all the time, right? So you could put in a network sensor, and you can get some detection going right away, which is why I like, is it this you know, minimal disruption to the users? It's either a tap insertion, which takes you know, a lot of times sessions don't even drop, um, or a span port or whatever. And again, our friends that, that like to attack E Corp, um, they always found the systems without the host-based stuff, right? So we had host-based firewalls and host-based um, all kinds of stuff, but they would always get the machines that didn't have it, right? So that's what we'd always find them, and they'd be on those machines. And you know, you can call those rogue machines, you can call them whatever you want, but they exist in every organization. But you can sort of see Lopan. I, um, there's a lot of problems with this, right? So in the in the um, in the the enterprise world, you have uh, lots of asynchronous routing, right? So you think of BGP, um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit deeper on this. Um, but you've got traffic going in one way and coming out the other. Well, you need both sides of the conversation to, to make some rational stuff out of it. Uh, encryption, obviously. Um, the bad guys know, know where your network detection is, and they'll try to avoid it. MPLS is another one. Um, uh, WAN optimization, so, um, and we'll go into each one of these. And then um, where the evolution of networking, where enterprise networking is going, and where detection needs are, are, are in a complete uh, direct conflict, right? Um, the network team wants to do things. Their, their main task is PNA. Um, the, you know, ours is security, and th those kind of conflict. So we can start with asynchronous routing, right? So you're going to have this no matter what, right? So um, you can do things like um, if you're using, say, like a an Arista or a Gigamon or something, you can combine your multiple. Let's say if you have two internet connections, right? Which is a a lot of times, when you have two different BGP routers, you're going to have a lot of asynchronous. So you can combine that traffic into a single um, um, connection, basically, and then you can load balance that across multiple sensors. Um, it, it's important to do asynchronous routing from your network team because there's a lot of costs associated, right? So let's say you've got a cogent connection and you've got a level 3 connection. Well, your cogent connection is a lot cheaper than your L3, and you're paying by how much bandwidth you use, right? So you're going to want to wait your cogent connection more than your L3. So a lot of your traffic when it comes in L3, if in it's, and it's an AT&T, uh, you know, BGP, uh, AS or whatever, it's going to say, okay, well, you go out the cogent one, right? Um, the only time it would go back out for sure would be if it's the destination's um, like an L3. So encryption, you're done, right? So if if they have encryption, um, or if you you're, you're it, it's Pretty self-explanatory why you can't really do much network detection with encryption. You can do things like SSL termination, like um, putting like an F5 in front of uh, web servers. 
uh, terminate the SSL there, and then you have HTTP between those, those um, termination devices and your web environment, which helps. Um, there are some commercial man in the middle products, um, but there's some, you know, there's uh, ethical questions about that, right? So if you work at a big company, most likely they are doing man in the middles for you. So when you go to your bank on your proxy server, um, they're seeing that. So, um, but you're still done. So let's talk about MPLS, right? And I'm going a little fast here just to try to save some time. So um, MPLS, network teams want to use this the right way, right? So back in the day, everything was hub and spoke, right? You have this big site and you have all your companies and all your um, connections coming into that big site and that's where everything took place. Um, well, what MPLS does is say, well, we'll dump all that into a cloud and then if I want to go from site one to site two, I don't have to go through site three. So I'm going to use this old laser pointer. So if I'm at site one and I want to go to site two in the hub and spoke model, I got to go this way, right? So this could be uh, California, this could be Washington, you know, like Seattle, and this could be New York. So for me to talk, I've got to go through. So that, that's, you know, you got to have way more bandwidth here and it's in inefficient. Well, you, you want it from the typical detection perspective, you want to have monitors here, right? So they, because you want to see this communication. If they're talking directly, you're not going to see that in the typical deployment of network intrusion detection, right? So that costs more money. Um, it's, the funny thing is, is lots of people create hub and spoke networks on top of MPLS, um, and they do, you know, they do that for the monitoring. Then there's good old WAN optimization, um, right? So WAN op is pretty cool. So the um, the the main goal of WAN optimization, let's say you have a huge engineering drawing, say you got a hundred gig worth of engineering data or something. The the thing is, you transfer it once, right? It's cached. So next time it goes through, that device says, oh, I've, I recognize this, right? And then it can provide that without having to transfer all that stuff over the WAN. That's great. But if you're at your egress point um, or your, your main business point and you're seeing that traffic, you, on, you only see it the very first time. Well, you might not have known that was malicious the first time, right? Now you know that's malicious, but the problem is since you're using WANOP, you're not seeing it anymore, right? Because you're not seeing the flow. Because it says, "Hey, I see this. I'm done. You know, right? I, I, you get this. I don't need to. I don't need to pull that across the WAN." So that breaks it. Um, so that just requires another sensor on, um, you know, the unoptimized side. So I've been talking about how uh, network stuff sucks, right, for a while. So it's. Uh, you know, it's time to look at ways that we can address this, right? So, um, you know, the first step is no more whiz bangery, right? So, um, what I mean by that is that there's not one easy solution, right? There's not one box that you can buy. There's not anything. You, your adversary, when they're motivated, right, they will change tactics and that they will do things faster than you can have meetings to talk about budgets, to talk about approvals for things, right? So you need a platform that is very flexible. Um, you know, the, when I talked about before that the, the choke points in Evolution Network are, are, you know, doing this, right? I want to have MPLS. I want to do these things. I want to have bring your own device. I want to do all this kind of stuff. And security saying, no, it's got to come through here so we can put our whiz-bang device in there to see, right? And then it's like, okay, I've got these awesome indicators, right, on my sensors. Well, why can't I use that for other things? So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but flexibility is the most important part of a detection strategy. So the reason we were able to go after that adversary and lock them out, um, well, t temporarily lock them out, um, is because we were flexible, because we could change on a dime, right? So. This is where a lot of times open source is great because um, if you're looking, if you're working with a vendor and you're saying, I need to detect this, well, we'll get back to you. Or that's a feature, you know, and, and that's coming out in sixth quarter next year, you know, um, we'll have that. Um, but that's not good enough for you because they're actively stealing your stuff, right? Um, so one quick question um, is, does anybody know uh, why the adversary likes to use RAR files to do exfil? Anyone? Because they're lossless. And you, you don't actually have to send the entire file to start recovery data. Right. Yeah. You already knew that one. That's cheap. 
So um, <laughs> I used to work with this. So, um, so they like to use RAR files. So the, the, the bad guys know that when they do something, when they're going to get, when they're trying to move a terabyte of data, they're not going to send it at 20K a second so it goes under the radar, right? Because they want to get it. So they're going to throw the, um, the juiciest stuff they got on you in the beginning of these files. And they're going to try to just shoot it out as fast as possible. Well, that's going to light up everything, right? All of a sudden, I can't get my internet connection, so whatever. They do that because if they, when you, when you, they know you're going to cut it off. So when you cut it off, they've got you know, X percent of that. If you use zip, that checksum information is at the end, and you don't, it, it, you, that data is useless. So they do that. So by having more coverage out there and more flexibility, you can see... Uh, you can try to get to it before they get to that stage, right? You're not going to stop them from getting in. They're going to get in, right? Um, but you want to stop them before they get to the exo point. Uh, so that's important. And so, you know, just some Mad Max in there. There's no shiny and chrome fix that you can put in there to do that. So how do we fix this, right? So we need to go where the users are, right? Because that's what they do, right? So we got to adjust to their TTPs, right? They're going after the users. They're going after... Um, Bill Smith's laptop that has, you know, where he's working on this proposal, right? So, you know, you, you'll see a lot of sales espionage, right? So there could be a foreign entity that is bidding, you know, that has a state-controlled business that's bidding against you for some deal. It's not uncommon for them to go after the sales guy. They know who he is, right? They know the regional, so they went to the website, they know Bill Smith is the regional sales guy for this thing, and they know that this, that E Corp is bidding on this, right? So they're going to go after that. It's, to most people, it's like, oh, they stole a Word doc. But what was in that Word doc was what you were going to quote. And that's real money loss, right? So they can say, you were going to say, this is going to cost a million dollars. And they say, well, well, we'll give it to you for 750, 750K, right? So that's, a, you know, it can be something as small as that. Um, or, you know, the plans to the Death Star that are 10 terabytes and it, that takes it. So networks are obviously distributed. So should your detection, right? So you know, when we talked about the whiz banger and having some big device in there. Um, but what that means is lots of bro and lots of places. And that has its own challenges. So what I, what I did is I stole some of the con concepts from distributed computing, right? So introducing the double-decker couch. So we use sensors for the resources, right? So um, these things had to be throwaway. And we'll, We'll go into that a little bit here in a second, but um, they need to run on anything. They need to run from a Raspberry Pi to like a you know a hot 32 core, a terabyte of RAM machine. Um, but we have to manage this as like a single device. We have to manage this that says, okay, I've got this. You know, if you draw it on a map, I got this cloud of sensors. Um, I can't go out there and do this by hand, right? Um, I've the the my previous gig we had. Uh, 500 and something sensors. Um, I'm currently rolling one out that's going up to 1,800. We're at about 660. Um, so you know, it's a, it's a, you run into unique challenges when you do it this way. But you also get, gain some very unique visibility. So um, you know, we, we, there's an organization we went from not being able to see anything to watching people walk around with bad stuff on their phones in you know, some of their locations, right? So. Um, so how do we do this, right? So we do this by making our sensors dumb, right? And I, and I mean that in the way of we take as much stuff off there as possible, right? So the Intel framework is awesome, but uh, we don't need to put, I don't need to put Intel on the box, right? I just need it to capture, I need the con log, I need the DNS log, I need it to capture that data and ship it somewhere else that I can do something with it. Um, and that's their job, right? So I'm not... I'm just using these as dumb workers to send the information up. And it, you know, if you um, at Robin's presentation where he had the, um, you know, the, the, that framework up there, that's you know, it could this could lend you know, this concept lends well to that because you're just having it do this, send it somewhere else, and then have that apply those indicators on there. Um, you want to use low-powered devices, right? So, you know, the one thing is like, okay, I've used a bunch of cheap devices, but this stuff is expensive to run, right? It's eating up power, which that's. You know, for a lot of companies, that's a big concern. Um, so low power devices. So, but it's, you know, these things are expendable. Like uh, the, the whole thing we do is if you troubleshoot a box for more than 20 minutes, 
reboot or uh, rebuild it, right? So, and that's th that's you know how you deal with it. So you don't spend you, you don't when you have two thousand sensors, you don't have time to go into every little thing. What what would this be? Just reimage it, and you're back up and running, and it's all good. So, um, but how you do this and to get it to scale? So I use Salt. You can use um, Puppet. You can use Chef. You can use whatever thing you want to use to do this, but I prefer salt because it's very, um, very scalable and very simple. So this right here is horizontally scalable. I can create as many minion masters as I want. So GitHub holds all the code. So one, one big challenge we had at eCorp was um, you know, all the rules and all these things that are happening um, all the time that what change broke something, what change created all this packet loss. Um, I'm going to pick on analysts here a little bit. You know, the, the whole thing is I want to detect all the things, right? Um, well, you can't detect all the things because you have a finite amount of resources on a sensor, and you put some crappy rule out there, and you're going to start seeing 90% packet loss, right? Not that I've seen that happen before, but just saying. So, um, so by, being, by being able to do this and scale this, um, you know, you can go, um, you, well, I mean, 2,000 is probably, you know, what I'm setting off, and I'm using, I think, four masters for that, and then the master masters. But having that GitHub component helps you in the PCI world, right? This is my change control, and nobody wants to deal with PCI, but, you know, this gets them off your back. Um, but it also gives you that ability to roll back, roll back those changes, and then get more collaboration from all your different analysts on saying, okay, I got this, I got this, just like normal code, right? So all your detection lives in that GitHub. When it's approved, it gets pushed to that master of masters, and then the master of master job is just to facilitate syncing of these guys, and then these guys pick a random minion master and check in at a predetermined time. I use 15 minutes. So all the minions do is do work, right? So they check in um, every 15 minutes, uh, and this allows us to have a pretty similar config. So we have um, one file, um, it's one salt state, that has unique information to that sensor. But everything else across the board is exactly the same. So it has, like, you know, what is my host name, stuff like that. Um, a lot of things you can pull out of what are called salt grains, but we won't go into that. So I'm going to, um, so this is sort of just a demo. I'm not going to let it go all the way through. Um, this is just shows how to, uh, this is how we build our sensors. Um, we actually have automated this piece uh, where we're doing the key accept. Um, but right now what we're doing is this is, the, this is the minion and this is the master. And the minion's just saying, hey, I want to check in, but it's a key-based authentication, right? So it's, it's got the, I see the key going in there and I'm going to accept it. So after I do that, um, we go back over here to the, uh, the minion and we just say check in again, right? So before you didn't recognize me, um, I'm just saying, you know, is bro running? Because uh, at the end of this, I show that bro's running. Um, so I'll just let it run here for a second. And then, uh, here we go. And I did this so that I don't have to do a live demo and screw something up and uh, look like an idiot up here. So it's just doing its check-in. And then what's going to happen, and I'll explain it since we're on time crunch here, um, what's going to happen is it's going to download all of its packages, right? So if you're using a chef or a puppet or something like that, all we're using here are the package management module. So it just did a, a yum update here because we use CentOS, right? Um, so it just downloaded all of its up-to-date packages, so right, it's the, the latest and greatest of everything. Um, we then install all of our custom packages, right? So we, we use PFRing and Bro, um, so we install those. Um, we have this custom thing that we use to, to send some data. Um, there's tons of ways to send the data. We won't go into that, but um, you know we do this so that you know when I talked about before, it's like if you're troubleshooting a sensor and 15 minutes goes by and you can't figure it out, that the, the reason this is you, it's one command, right? So I just boot up um, off of a off of a bootable media, put in the host name information, the IP, to get it on the network, and then I say check in, and then you're done. So anyway, this runs through. It's installing the custom packages, but I won't go too deep into it. Um, so that's really cool, but uh, how do I detect stuff, right? I'm just saying, I'll make them stupid, make them dumb, um, do all this stuff, right? So the way you do this is you break it into a service-based architecture, right? And what that does, you know, the, there was lots of talk about um, 
like zero MQ and stuff in the broker discussion, is you break it up into multiple services. So you have a rule service, right? That's where you're doing your PCRE. Um, when, you, when you look at this model from a, like a cloud model, um, and, and specifically the rules, you, when you have a sensor and you put a crappy rule on there, the, the result is you're going to get packet loss, right? You're going to start seeing packet loss. You're going to miss stuff. When you have this kind of um, service-based architecture, you're just going to be a little bit behind, right? I would rather be behind than losing stuff. Um, and this forces the data to be centralized, not the devices, right? So before, we were taking all these connections and everything, and we were putting these big old boxes in the data centers, right? So Because we're going to centralize the data. We're going to centralize this stuff. Uh, or centralize the devices, right? So we get it. So we're still accomplishing that mission, but we're just pushing the data up, not the devices, right? Um, and then it's a lot cheaper for me. I, does, has anybody ever tried to get a server into Brazil? Yeah. It takes like four months. You've got to bribe some officials and everything like that, right? So you can't, if, if, if I'm starting to see a lot more traffic on my Brazil sensor, I can't just call somebody and say, hey, can you add another server in there? Uh-uh. It, it does not work that way, right? Um, so it puts the horsepower that you need in the places that it's easy to, right? So since you're centralizing this and you're sending it all up, I can call my data center people and say, hey, or I can click another box on Amazon and you know, get that box immediately versus have to spend six months trying to get something into Brazil. Um, but there still needs to do deep packet inspection. So there are some policies you'll still put out there, but you can, you know, you can do a lot of things. And how we do this is with a pub sub architecture, right? So we ship them from Bro into some sort of um, pub sub architecture, so Redis or RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ. Um, and then we have subscribers to those queues, right? So you can have an archive service. You can have all these other things. You can do anything you want to do with the data because you're getting a copy of it. But you're not going to you're not going to break anything on the sensor, right? You're not going to do it because all it's doing is sending the data, right? So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in that front um, when it comes to that stuff. So expensive rules mean more work, not you know lost packets. So here's just a um, sample architecture. So you take a log ingest. We're using uh, zero MQ in this case. Um, and then we're splitting it into three different things. So you have your rules engines. That's where your atomic indicators, right? So that's you're looking at um, IPs, domain names, uh, MD5 sums, SHA-56. Then you've got an index service that's putting into a database. And then you've got like an archive process. So I, in that previous slide, we were doing log ingest, right? So this is something, um, and David's not here, but the, it's called enterprise um, security monitoring. So ESM. So the concept is, I've got this great Intel, right? I've got this, all these different feeds. I've got this Intel team who, you know, they say they're awesome because they have 8 million indicators, even though 7 million are worthless. But, you know, they have that stuff, right? And they want to apply all that. They want to detect all the things, right? So um, why just detect all the things on your network sensors? Um, so I get IP addresses in my firewall logs, in my proxy logs, in my web server logs. I might not have a sensor there, right? But I now have visibility, right? So if I know 1.2.3.4 is bad, and I don't have a sensor, but I've got this um, web server in Brazil, just gonna pick on Brazil, I at least get that log event and say, okay, there's something going on in Brazil, we better check that out, right? Um, so, so URIs and URLs, so you get that from obviously the HTTP log, but you got proxy logs and web server logs. Again, same kind of concept. So now I've extended my detection, not from just Bro, but to all these different things to, to make that flexible thing happen here, right? And then obviously domains, you can get them from DNS logs, proxy logs, and everything like that. So would you like to know more? Um, uh, Dave Bianco has a great presentation on ESM that he did in B-Sides Augusta, so um, that's something to, to check out if you haven't seen it yet, and that's his contact stuff. But again, he's not here, so I was going to give him a dollar for uh, you mentioned his name. So, what did we what did we improve with this, right? So I've been up here blabbering for a while. What did what did we change, right? So because we're down at the site level, right? So now we've got let's say you've got 100 locations. Now that I'm at the location level, um, I can see when somebody from this site talks to somebody from this site. I can't see user to user at that site, but you got to start somewhere, right? So that gives us 
the ability to do things like MPLS the right way. So I might want to use internet access that's, um, you, you know, like a lot of people with MPLS, what they do is you, they dump everything out to their MPLS cloud, and if it's destined for the internet, they go to the closest pop, and it goes out to the internet. It's very efficient when it comes to latency and things like that when it comes to um, using network. Uh, but that hurts you if you're trying to, you, there's no way that you can say, hey, at and I need to put a sensor on your network so I can catch the stuff that's going out there for the internet traffic. That doesn't work. So you gotta be at the site level. Asynchronous is not as much of an issue because you're, um, you can always bring the conversation down back to that single point, um, so to the site level. So uh, if you have an internet connection, you can see that, but it's, you're still gonna run into it. That's just, you know, especially if you have two large data centers with lots and lots of traffic, you're gonna see it. And it gives us the ability to see that traffic before it's optimized, right? So we talked before about way and optimization and all the things involved there. And it gives you more eyes and more places to detect lateral movement. And this is the most important. The, you're not going to know what the bad guys are going to do next. A lot of times, you're not going to know they're in there until they screw up, right? So, you know, lots of places that, are, you know, that I've been in, they're like, yeah, we haven't, we haven't had anything. We're great. You know, we haven't had any alerts. We're, we're good for like, for, you know, for the past three months. Well, at eCorp, we were scared shitless when that happened, right? Because we knew they were there. We just weren't detecting them, right? So um, by having those eyes and more detection gives you that ability to catch the bad guys, right? So it's not a silver bullet. There's no such thing. But the flexibility at least says tomorrow, if some new tool comes out, that can decode some sort of C2 or something, I can send that out to every single one of my sensors at every single one of my locations by pushing a button and have it, right? I, if I need to add a, um, a bro policy that to do some deep packet stuff, I can click a button and have it across my entire environment within 15 minutes, right? So I'm treating my entire enterprise or my entire organization as one big sensor um, and then pulling all that data. So. Uh, with that, I left like five minutes for questions. So any questions? Have you ever tried switching your patents instead of logs? So um, do you, do, have you ever thought about shipping events versus logs? Um, I don't know what I don't know, right? So I, I don't want to limit myself to using something like the notice log that says, you know, hey, uh, I detected this, right? Um, because a lot of times I'm waiting for them to screw up, right? So they screw up, and now I need to pick the pieces up and put it back together and, and frame the incident and say, okay, this is what they did. Now I can create detection off that, right? Um, that's another reason for full PCAP, right? I know that there was talk before about um, like time machine and shunting the stuff. One of the things you get hit with in the enterprise is when exfil happens, what's the first question they get asked when that happens? Yes, exactly. What did we lose, right? So if you're doing, if you're only c capturing the first, you know, 2,000 bytes or whatever, you're not going to answer that question, and that's very, very important when to, you know, you're talking lawyer people, right? Sometimes you can because you can say oh, that was this file. Right, but they they rename files all the time. Do like they <laughs> they do all kinds of stuff, right? From that, they 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 hide their tracks very well. Right, so having the original, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do time machine stuff, um, but I'm saying a lot of times in enterprises, you, you don't have that luxury, unfortunately, which costs more money and you need more space, right? So when I talk about PCAP, I think I've got one customer, they're gonna be around seven petabytes of PCAP across their entire organization, right? So if they see an event at one of these the sensors out at these sites from the bro logs, they're gonna be able to reach out and grab that packet as long as it has that retention there. Right. Well, I mean, so, so the the thing is using like, um, so more. I, I guess you're saying more granular than the logs using the, the, sort of the events within the, the, the connection log. Right. Is that what you're saying? One massive bro cluster. Right. And what I thought when you said that was you could see like a bro master that gets all of the bro events over broccoli or bro. Right. Or yeah. And then if you can write policies against those events beyond the So the challenge there, um, and let me get back to this slide. So the challenge there is that these connections for small sites are not very fast, right? So these aren't 
these are individual, technically, these are individual bro clusters. So we run, um, we don't run standalone mode, obviously, because a lot of times that's not enough horsepower to get there. So, you know, we typically run four to six um, bro workers on each one of these minions, right? So um, because there's not that bandwidth there, right, you've got to do the log event. So I, at least I know that this connection went from here to there for this long and this much data was transferred. Um, so that I can do that. And then, like I said, I can fall back to the full packet. So if I wanted to rerun that through a bro, uh, like a you know, local instance, and do some things like that, I could still do that by grabbing that PCAT. But you know, you've got, you know, it's a small site, they might have a five meg connection or one meg connection. Or it could be over a satellite in some oil field out in the middle of nowhere, right? So just sending the logs causes network team panic, right? Um, we're gonna, you're gonna send logs, no. Uh, what is that going to do the bandwidth? And we, you know, we get about 10 to 1 compression. There's other ways you can do it, but, um, you know, it's very important to compress it so the network people chill out because they freak out um, a lot. So, you know, and anytime there's like a, a bump in logs, they're, they're on you like, hey, you guys are sending way more traffic. Well, there's more traffic being generated, so that just happens. Any other questions? Question about that log contention with the, with the regular traffic. And you ever set up minions where they have a separate backhaul network? Um, so the question was, have you ever set up where you have minions with a separate backhaul network? Uh, no, generally because the, the, um, the, the idea is to get it out there fast, right? So um, to put it on existing stuff. So that's where the compression comes involved so that we can say, hey, we can go on your two meg connection that's only 20% utilized. We'll, you know, we'll only make it 25% utilized now, um, get over it. Uh, that kind of thing, right? Um, so you could do that, like in, if you had, uh, you know, a, like a, in a data center scenario. Um, but again, since you're pulling all the logs at the central point and doing the stuff there, it makes it a little bit, a uh, little bit easier to do that. Did you have any deployments where countries' local data privacy laws cause you to change what you're collecting, and so how do you handle it? Yeah. So the, the question is. Um, Data privacy in different countries. I love France. I love France. Uh, Germany is another great one. Um, so here's the thing. Which, yes, we ran into that. And a lot of times, a lot of the countries, the, the works councils and all those things, didn't want us to put any detection in there, right? So the bad guys know that too, right? So what do they do? They know, well, if I exfil everything through France, I'll be good. So they started doing that, right? So. The problem with data privacy and what happens with a lot of things is that they say, look, we can put in some sort of detection or we can continue to let you, or we're going to just shut you off. Like, we're not going to do business in this country anymore because if we can't have that visibility in there, there's nothing we can do. But, so, but yeah, they, they love to find the countries that had stricter data, uh, data privacy events and do stuff. So, um, again, they're adjusting to our TTPs and our, our requirements. So, any other questions? you check the integrity of the logs that are being transferred? Um, so each, yes and no. So each individual log event, before it gets sent up, we put a unique identifier on it. Um, so that, that stays from there to the, the next point. But there's no, you know, somebody could tech, and that whole conversation is encrypted and compressed. Um, so they would have to manipulate the logs locally to do something, and you've got a really big problem if that happened, right? So, um, but generally, we each event on each one of these sensors is its own unique event across the board. So you can search for that unique event if you uh, if you wanted to, and that's generated at the time when it pulls it out of the con log and sends it up to the you know your log aggregator. How do you make sure that uh, events in different geographic locations get a different <coughs> event ID? So we, we don't really key off of event ID, right? So um, we key off that other value that I was talking about. So we don't really, um, you know, that's not really an issue for us, right? So an event's an event, um, and we know the unique, event, the unique event ID that it came from. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, some of the things we do there to, in case stuff wants to step on it. And then you, and you're also going to have the cases where you're going to detect the same event in multiple places, right? Since you have this bunch of visibility, you're going to see it in multiple places, which is good for checks and balances, right? So if you know that you've got it where it started, but you don't see where it ended, you know you have a problem 
you know, if, if that, you know, my data center either dropped it or something, somebody moved a, a port span or something, somebody did something bad and I'm not seeing it. So although you're getting double data in some instances, the alternative or the alternative is not as good as doing that, right? So it gives you some checks and balances, but it does add extra data. So with, um, uh, you know, 600 something sensors right now with, we don't have all the bro logs turned on. We're doing something like 60 to 70,000 events per second from all the bro logs going in. And that's probably gonna climb to like 110,000 events per second. So it's a lot of events, um, which is why you need that scalable architecture to deal with it. You have any issues with time synchronization? So um, we use UTC across everything, right? So um, there's no time zones involved. Um, and then every sensor runs its own uh, NTP stuff. So we, we, we depend on the local box to make sure its time is correct. And by inserting that into the log, that, in, that initial time, so we key off of like when we're doing um, an investigation, we don't key off of the time that it got inserted in the database, because sometimes because of queuing and stuff like that, it can be later. We key off the, with the, bro, um, the, the bro time off of the bro event, right? So we use that, um, which is great, because then when you do things like, I want to search, um, and you can, like, if you want to carve something out, you can take that duration out of that bro con, and then, you know, so, say, what, I know this lasted this long, what happened right after that, right? So you can, you can um, direct your searches more, uh, um, you know, sharply so that it doesn't blow up your database. Because as you can imagine, it gets kind of crazy with that many events per second. Um, so you mentioned a lot about um, don't troubleshoot for longer than 20 minutes, just re-image the sensors. Yep. Um, that's a very static config, and you mentioned pushing out the same config to all the sensors, et cetera. Did you ever work more on dynamic configurations where, for instance, you're seeing an event in a particular region spin up new instances or more monitors or more sensors in that <coughs> so, so generally, it's pretty static, right, from the standpoint of, um, again, you've got finite resources at the site, right? So you don't have a lot of unused capacity. So the question was, um, you know, dynamic sensor, uh, making sure, see if you can, sp if you see some types of event, you can spin up more devices and things like that. Um, the, the, uh, the thing is, it's hard to get those resources, it's hard to spend, it's not like Amazon where you can click a button, right? So you've got, you know, you've got to deal with what you've got there, right? So this, um, I do have dynamic in the st standpoint that each s sensor can have unique values if you want, and that overrides the static values that get applied across it. So you can do things like that. So if you wanted to run a special rule set for that country that is having that event, um, you know, you could have a bro policy that's different for that box than anything else. So, but it looks like um, I'm about to get kicked out. So if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to hit me up. I'll be around all week. <laughs>